tell him another time. It's through his blood. That's how I've been set free. That's one of the words for salvation, to be delivered. I am delivered. Sin had its grips, but through its blood. You do know that's a good shouting point for the saint. Not my good works, not my might, not my power, but through his blood. That's how I got set had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, look, you are made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews, that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Amen. I want to talk about the sin of a crippled man. The sin of a crippled man. On last Sunday we were in the previous verses of this chapter our subject was how to break a bad cycle. Yeah. This man had been crippled for 38 years. We don't know how old he was, so we don't know if he was crippled from birth. Um, but we know for 38 years of his life, he couldn't walk. He sat with a multitude of other sick folk. Waiting on an angel to trouble the pool. Yeah. Because his belief, according to verse 4, which is excluded from many translations, including the original Greek text, he believed that at a season an angel would come and trouble the water. And if he could just get in there. He would get healed. And Jesus asked him a question that most of us don't want to answer. Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? He answered like many people would answer. He started rehearsing all his excuses and his bad experiences. He was basically saying, of course I want to be made whole. That's why I'm here. Yeah. But won't nobody help me. All right. And 
Jesus said, help yourself. Yeah. 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 Right. Rise up and walk. Yeah. Immediately the man took up his bed and walked. And then, this is part of the text that we closed on, the religious folk, the Jews, saw him carrying his bed, and they said, man, it's the Sabbath. It's the day of rest. You're not supposed to be carrying your bed on this day. They rebuked him for reacting to wholeness. But they were silent during his sickness. I said something whether you know it or not. That there are a whole lot of people who are comfortable with you being crippled. But they're going to complain when you get up and walk. There's something about misery that loves company. I, most people, they, they, they don't mind you doing okay as long as they're doing a little better. But whenever you start doing better than them, then they've got a complaint. And so now the issue is he has broken their law or their interpretation of the law because he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath. Now, remember, this these are the complaints of the religious community, the church. And there's some today who criticize preachers for not preaching enough sermons on sin. They, they base their opinion on the day when we had many preachers who were called fire and brimstone preachers. Right, 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 right. They preached about sin regularly. And they talked about judgment with sin. Yeah. And I do want to put a footnote there. This is not really a part of the sermon, but I just put it in there for free. <laughs> that we really aren't judged for our sin. We're judged by our sin. They both come in the same package. But there was a day where the fine brimstone preachers talked so much about sin and, and hell that often their sermons would make you scared to go to sleep at night. Yeah. Scared you might go to sleep and not wake up. Or, or worse, wake up in hell. Some of those sermons would make women scream and men would hold on to the benches out of fear that they might slip off the bench and fall in hell. They made hell so vivid. And they painted the picture so that what church preaching was really about was you being rebuked, condemned, and warned about your sin. The reality is that the old preacher was really preaching morality. And the church ought to address morality. But it's really dealing with morality and trying to scare you into being moral. He came down hard on drinking and dancing, gambling, and sex outside of marriage. These were the things that were ruining the black family. And the family is the foundation of the community. Black men couldn't afford to take care of his family and spend his money on liquor. Come on, help me somebody. So the preacher came hard on drinking. He came hard on him going to the juke joint. The nightclub. And dancing because there he would dance and drink and hook up with other women. He didn't have enough money to drink, gamble, hook up with other women and take care of his family. So the pulpit tried to scare men into doing the right things for the family and the community. Now our communities have changed so much. The pulpit is in disarray 
because there's no agreement on what the moral code ought to be. Amen. People are marrying later. Yeah. It used to be common for teenagers to get married. Yeah. And have plenty of children. Yeah. The Bible says be fruitful and multiply. That was one verse. They kept loyalty. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so rare now that it's hard to even remember that, that, that people would have double digit numbers of children. Ten plus. Amen. I went to one church that was preaching a revival and one of the deacons and his wife had so many children. I said to him, man, when you tell your wife good night, you mean it, don't you? <laughs> were married young, had plenty of children, and it was the man's responsibility to financially take care of his family. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't about him being happy or her being happy. Yeah. It was about the family staying together. Yeah. He had to work, because the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. And her job was to make sure when he got home, he didn't have to deal with a whole lot of stress because she wanted him rested, relaxed, and well-fed so he'd go out and work tomorrow. But, but our families have changed now. People are marrying later. And with people marrying later, men used to be expected to be providers and stay married. Even if he was miserable or she was miserable. But now the culture has deliberately changed. Somebody ought to just say deliberately. So that in many instances, women have larger salaries than men. And because she has a larger salary than he does, she's quick to tell him, Negro, I don't need you. And the church is so messed up in many instances that pulpits will tell her she don't need it. Heard too many preachers lie and tell women, baby, all you need is Jesus. And Jesus is good. But he ain't going to take the role of a husband. Help me if you can. Because he is the savior of my soul. But there are some things I don't expect Jesus to do for me. So our culture now is empowering women. And by empowering women, what it's doing is, it's empowering women to go into roles they weren't created to go into. She's got more money in the bank, and she's got more freedom, right. but there's still inner hurt. Yeah. 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 Help me if you can. Yeah. And so because there's inner hurt, oh God, I wasn't planning to go here, but here we go. Because there's inner hurts, now she's looking for a companion that doesn't have to be male. Somebody who understands her. Amen. Well, of course, a sister's going to understand you. Because y'all were made alike. But just because you were made alike doesn't mean God intended for you to try to make a family. When James first started at Huffman, I asked one of the assistant principals, I said, "What? how are things at the school in terms of violence? And she said to me, well, honestly, she said, most of the fights we have are girls fighting girls over girls. And when I talked to some other uh, faculty at other schools, they said, same thing over here. And so now the role has shifted so that now we're winking at 
gay thugs. Where that come from? He a thug, but because he has been in many instances, not in all instances, but in many instances because he's been locked up. Now he's assimilated to a culture where he doesn't have to just like women to be a thug. I wish I could say it like I want to say it, but y'all know where I'm And our communities are in such disarray that now if you preach a, a moral code of male and female, folk will leave church. Saying it's the preacher's opinion. No, it ain't. It's the word of God, number one. But number two, it's the logical order of creation. You can get a whole bunch of male animals and say you're going to reproduce them and sell them. You ain't going to reproduce nothing if ain't no female there. I don't care what animal you choose. Dogs, cats, chickens, hogs. There has to be male and female to reproduce. Now we're so confused, we don't know what to believe. Our communities have so dramatically changed. Homosexuality used to be rare and hidden. Talk to me if you can. If, 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 if there was somebody in the community who practiced it, they tried to keep it private. Now, not only is it not kept private, you are branded names if you disagree with the lifestyle. They call you homophobic. It, I'm not homophobic. Phobic means fear. I'm not afraid. I just disagree with the lifestyle. If that's your private choice, I don't even want to know about it. But when you make it public, then I have a right to voice my opinion. Our communities are in trouble. And if we preach a moral code that pr promotes the traditional family, millennials won't come. And if you preach a modern view of family, the pulpit has to relinquish the Bible as its authority, and so as a result, the pulpit starts saying whatever brings in people and money. So the church becomes an echo of the world, and when the church is an echo of the world, the church becomes unnecessary. So Jesus heals a man, and the church is man. I said, Jesus does something, and the religious community that claims loyalty to God who is his father, they are upset with what Jesus has done. Yeah. I want to suggest to you we have to make sure that we get upset about some stuff, but not upset over the things that Christ has done. Amen. The Bible says be angry and sin not. And the context of that is, yes, you ought to be angry, just don't sin in your anger. Some stuff ought to upset you. Some things should make you mad. That's why, yes, I believe in forgiveness, but you need to be angry before you forgive. Yeah. Oh, Lord. And, and, and so, yes, there are injustices and there are uh, evils done in this world, and we don't come to church so we can learn how to smile when we look at them. We ought to be angry. Just don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's when you sin, when you let it become bitterness and when you allow it to cause you to operate based on your anger. But be angry about some stuff. Some stuff angered Christ. That's why he cleaned the temple out. So Jesus says to this man who has been lame for 38 years, at the pool of Bethesda with a whole bunch of other sick folk. Yeah. Believing in the troubling of the water by an angel, which was superstition. Jesus said to him, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing happen to you. 
So since some people think we should talk more about sin, and I have no argument with that, we need to at least know what sin is. Yeah. Sin is missing the mark, aim, or scope of life. If you don't know what sin is, you won't know what a correct moral code is. The word sin comes from the field of archery where you aim for the bullseye. And if you miss the bullseye, it was said, you have sinned. And so biblically, sin is to aim at meaning and fulfillment of life and to miss the mark. You're aiming, but you're missing. So what is life? Missing the mark, aim, scope of life. What is life? Well, we were made in the image of God. So life, therefore, is reconciliation to God. Oh, help me here. So how do we get to God? This man thought the way to get to God is to sit at this pool and wait on an angel. So he was aiming for God, but missing. His theology suggested that only one person could get to God at a time. And you just had to be at the right place at the right time. And you had to hope somebody who was crippled like you was merciful enough to help you get in the pool instead of them. Now what's the odds of that? His whole theology was warped, but the problem is you can be surrounded by warped theology so long it starts making sense to you. He was aiming wrong. He was missing the mark. Therefore, he was guilty of sin. That was his sin. He was missing the mark. In verse 14, Jesus says, Go and sin no more. For 38 years he'd been crippled, so we know he wasn't doing the stuff the five brimstone preacher was talking about. He wasn't dancing, he was crippled. Come on, help me if you can. What was his sin? Was it drinking? There's nothing in the text that would imply drinking, being a drunkard was his sin. Was it extramarital affairs? That's quite unlikely. He's crippled, and he's in a, he's in a company of a whole bunch of crippled folk. That don't sound like a romantic scene to me. This man's sin was his faulty aim at the meaning of life. He didn't know that the right aim was for the Prince of Peace. He thought it was for the pool at Bethesda. In John 8, there was a woman caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus asked at the end of the story, woman, where are your accusers? She said, sir, I have none. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Right. What was her sin? Most people think her sin that Jesus was making reference to was adultery. It was not. Jesus never addressed adultery in that story. It was her accusers who did. Well, I hope y'all hear me. And so if the accusers were the ones who brought up adultery and Jesus did not bring up adultery, Jesus wouldn't have validated their claim. Even when Jesus addressed them and they left from the older to the younger, he still didn't address their topic. Because he knew they weren't after her. They were after him. The text says they did this so they could tempt him. They were trying to get him to stumble on a mistake because he'd been preaching his grace talk. So since you're preaching his grace talk, tell us to let her go and now you violated the law. But then if you tell us to stone her like the law says, now you've lost all your credibility on this grace talk. Right. 
And so Jesus didn't even address them. He started writing on the ground. And what Jesus has a way of doing is putting you in a position where you have to answer your own question. So Jesus wasn't addressing adultery. He never addressed that topic. The scribes and the Pharisees were the ones who addressed it. And when he addressed the scribes and the Pharisees, he used that law to reveal to them their hypocrisy. Amen. That here you are trying to stone this woman, and the verse says, let the one among you without sin, and in that verse, that word sin means, let the one among you who hasn't done the same thing. Amen. He was saying, let the one among you who ain't been with her. twisted the law so much you can stone her for doing what you did with her. That, that, that's the inequity of an unjust law where you can do something and it's okay, but I can do it and it's not okay. If I walk up accidentally in your apartment and shoot you intending to kill you, I ain't getting no ten years. But you can. And then twist it so much that I'm feeling sorry for you. I'm bugging you. Help me if you can. That, that's, that's how the law works. And so Jesus came and had a ministry where he was exposing how they had twisted the law so they could oppress the masses. When Jesus says, the poor you will have with you always, that wasn't a spiritual prophecy. Jesus was saying, your system is so corrupt, it's set up so you gonna always have poor folk. And he was saying to Judas, because this woman wants to bless me with what she has, if she gives it to the poor, it ain't gonna fix the system. All right, all right, all right. Amen. 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 Come on, so Jesus addressed that hypocrisy. Y'all were with her. That's how you call in the very act. I hope y'all hear me today. You, you weren't peeping Tom. That ain't how you call her. You were with her. And now you want to trick me into stoning her. Well, the one among you who weren't with her, you start calling her. And all of them had to leave. Jesus said to her, go and sin no more. So what did he mean by that? Go and no longer miss the mark. Or aim a scope of life. She aimed for God, but missed the mark because she expected the scribes and the Pharisees to declare her as righteous. Jesus says, Where are your accusers? They wanted you stoned. Where are your accusers? She said, Sir, I have none. And he was basically saying to her, I'm the only one here, and I'm not accusing you. Don't you leave me going back to them. Some, so many of us hold our heads down in despair because we think we don't measure up because we looked at our bank accounts. Yeah. You ain't been wrong. Yeah. That's sin. Some of you think I, I missed the mark because I don't have the degrees of someone who's really important and someone who matters. I, 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 I got a GED, may not even have a GED, and so I don't measure up. You're aiming wrong. Somebody else will say, when I look in the mirror, I don't look like I used to look. You get dissatisfied with what you see and you feel like you're less than. You're aiming wrong. It's a good moral code for you to get educated. It's a good moral code for you to manage your money right. It's a good moral code for you to carry yourself with pride and self-esteem, but that won't get you right with God and that doesn't make you a person who's living life to its full. You can have money. Yeah. You can look good. Yeah. You, 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 you can have all the stuff that on the outside makes you look like a success. But if you don't have Jesus Christ, you are guilty of sin. Right. 
Jesus says, they wanted to stone you, but they're gone. Goes and sin no more. Man, you better just pull up Bethesda. Now you're walking. You are whole. He saw him in the temple. You are walking. You are whole. Don't you go back to that pool. Because something worse going to happen to you. If you go back to that superstition, I'm the one that did this to you. Don't forget, I'm the one that set you free. There is but one sin that will send you to hell, and that's not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything else you can be forgiven for, but if you stand before God, having rejected Jesus Christ, in hell you'll lift up your eyes. Your view must be on him. It's all right to want more money and to work for more money and to learn how to invest your money. It's all right to look your best every time you can. It's all right to, to try and do those things that this world would deem successful for a right purpose and a right cause. But only what you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for him will be counted in the end. Only what you do for him really matters. Text proves it. Yes, yes. Jesus says, look at you, man. Yes. Verse 14. You're whole. Yes. Sin no more. Yes. Don't go back to this superstition. Lest the worst thing come unto thee. And the man departed. That's verse 15. And told them religious folk. Yes. It was Jesus. Yes. Yes. Once you come out of your sin, you need to go tell the mother sinners who have profited from your sin, look at me. I ain't like I used to be. I looked at my hands and my hands looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. I started to walk and I had a new walk. I started to talk and I had a new talk. And your pool didn't do this. Your superstition didn't do this. The scribes and Pharisees didn't do this. Jesus did this for me. I want to suggest to you, if you know that Jesus has made a change in your life, don't you quit, Jesus. So many of us start in Jesus and somewhere along the way it gets more difficult than we thought it would be because the crowd is still telling us to go back to the pool and because the crowd is at the pool and the crowd is telling us to go back to the pool, we go back to our own sin. But I want to tell you, if you start in Jesus and he brings you out, don't quit Jesus. Remember who did it for you. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. There are some times when you get by yourself and the crowd won't call you. The crowd won't visit you. But I'm so glad Jesus is still on the main line. I can call him and tell him what I want. When I call him, I'll get an answer. He watches over me all night long. He keeps me through the day. Can't nobody do for me what the Lord has done for me. And I'm not going to leave him. Christ is the object of our faith. I said Christ is the object of our faith. And we ought to tell it with boldness. And we ought to tell it with confidence. That's why when you gather in this place and we talk about Jesus, there ought to be some praise going on. Because when you've been in this world all week long and they're measuring you by your network and they're measuring you by your portfolio, when we gather here, we gather here as equals. There are no big eyes and little U's. It's just us. We have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another because we've exercised faith in Jesus Christ. And he took our rubbish and turned them into his rubies. He took our trash and transformed them into his treasure. He took our sin and gave us his salvation. He is the antidote to our ailments. He is the bomb to our bruises. He is the cure to our calamities. He's our divine deliverer. He's our 
grace of our errors and the fix of our faults. He is my everything. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. And it ain't no harm to keep my mind stayed on him. He picks me up, turns me around, places my feet on solid ground. You can have this whole world, but give me Jesus because he's a bridge over troubled waters. He's a rock in a weary land. He's shelter in stormy weather. He's a friend when you're friendless, a mother when you're motherless, a father when you're fatherless. He's shelter in stormy weather. He'll wipe tears from weeping eyes. Share your testimony by standing and waving your hand that Jesus is your friend. Jesus is your elder brother. Jesus is your strength when your strength is gone. Hey, all right. I said, hey, all right. Can you say yes? Yeah?
That's the only correct place to be. Candidate for baptism, let our Christian experience. If there's one, won't you come? Jesus.